So this talk is uh, a talk on CKD epidemiology, and it was supposed to originally be on Monday, Monday when it might have flowed a little bit better and you might have been a bit more interested in this. But uh, hopefully I'll try and keep your interest for the next half an hour at least. It is scheduled for 40 minutes, and this talk originally was supposed to be half an hour, so we'll probably finish a little bit early. Um, my goal here is to speak in general terms about CKD epidemiology and why early chronic kidney disease is important even if there is a lot of argument and discussion about the relevance of mild declines in GFR these days. So I'd like to start first with a question. A 65-year-old woman with a history of diabetes and hypertension presents for evaluation. Her serum creatinine is 1 and her serum cystatin C is 1.2. Which of the following GFR estimating equation best predicts her likelihood of mortality based on CKD category? Cockroft Galt, MDRD, CKD epi cystatin, CKD epi creatinine, or CKD epi creatinine cystatin C. The issue here is that whether or not she has CKD as defined by EGFR category depends on which equation you use. For example, her EGFR cystatin C is 56, which would classify her as stage 3 CKD, and her EGFR creatinine CKD epi is 63. So in general terms, which one of these categorizes her best in terms of her cardiovascular mortality risk? So we'll get back to the answer later. Chronic kidney disease is defined according to GF4 or non-GF4 determinants of kidney damage. The abnormality has to be present for at least three months. The first most common definition is a decline in GF4 to less than 60 mils per minute. The reality is that we don't really measure GF4 very often anymore, so that for most individuals, what we are really talking about here is a decline in estimated GF4, with all the limitations that these equations have. For the purposes of this talk, at least, I'm going to focus mostly on the first definition, because that is where most of the large-scale epidemiology work has been focused, and where, the, where there is most controversy. However, CKD can also be defined by a number of other measures, including microalbuminuria, structural abnormalities found in imaging, this is very nonspecific and not well defined. Uh, electrolyte disorders attributable to abnormal tubular function, uh, glomerular hematuria and other urine sediment abnormalities, and a history of kidney transplantation. We further divide CKD into categories based on GF4, and this is important because there are clear differences in risk depending on which category you're placed in. This is a very nice figure from the KDGO guidelines in 2012 that stratifies patients' risks by GF4 and albuminuria category. Risk here is not completely defined, but it includes the risk of mortality, cardiovascular disease, and end-stage renal disease. Later, we'll go back into the individual risk for each category. The first thing to note here is that despite the fact that individuals at EGF4 greater than 60 are defined as CKD, so these stages one and two here. Uh, in the absence of albuminuria, the risk profile is identical to the population as a whole. One of the most frustrating things that I face in my practice is patients whose chart list, charts list them as CKD stages, stage three, who wonder where stages one and two went and why nobody told them they had kidney disease. The reality is that this nomenclature is a holdover from the early days of widespread use of GFR estimating equations and does not really reflect clinical practice or reality. There are some who would argue that CKD stage 3A is not, not a real disease either and that it's just a normal part of aging. However, you can see from this figure that the risk increases even at this low level of GFR, even at this level of GFR. It is true that for the majority of these patients will not reach end-stage renal disease, but they are at significant risk of early more cardiovascular mortality, and identifying them could lead to better management of risk factors for both primary and secondary prevention. It is also notable how the presence of albuminuria modifies the risk profile. Individuals with even CKD stage 3A who have significant proteinuria have the same risk profile as individuals with CKD stages 4 and 5. In every CKD category, there's a graded increase in risk with increase in urinary protein. So how do we determine whether or not somebody has CKD? We can either measure or estimate GF4. Measuring GF4 involves determining the urinary clearance of a filtration marker, such as creatinine or inulin, 
or a plasma clearance of exogenous markers. The advantage of this method is clear. It is accurate, at least when complete collections are obtained. However, it is inconvenient for patients, expensive, and not suitable for population-based screening. Not to mention that for repeated measures are really unfeasible outside of a research setting. For these reasons, we primarily use estimated GF4 these days. These estimates are based on serum levels of filtration markers, such as creatinine or cystatin C. The advantages are that you get rapid results, they're inexpensive, and thus are suitable for population screening. The disadvantages are obvious. There are non-GF4 determinants, such as muscle mass or inflammation, that can influence marker concentrations. There is variability between assays that could make comparison between institutions difficult, and they are grossly inaccurate in non-steady state situations, such as acute kidney injury or recovery from ATN. Given that all of the current guidelines suggest using estimated G estimating equations to classify patients according to GF4 category, it is important to note that these equations are not particularly accurate even in the most ideal of circ circumstances. This is a slide from the 2002 KDOKI guidelines that uses data from the MDRD study to show how the various estimating equations performed relative to measured GF4. The Cs here are refer to calibrated levels, so when you use calibrated levels, the, the results are somewhat better. And in the majority of institutions these days, I think we use calibrated creatinine values. Here you can see that although the MDRD study performed best, still about 10% of estimates did not reach the relatively low bar of being within 30% of the measured value. Interestingly, creatinine clearance measured by 24-hour urine performed worse than the MDRD, MDRD equation, probably because of incomplete urine collections as well as non-renal creatinine excretion, particularly at lower levels of GF4. So it's always important when you're using an estimating equation to look at the results in the context of the, of the individual patient and remember that there's a good chance that it's actually not correct. More recently, the CKD epi equation was developed. This was derived here in Boston using a patient group that was more diverse than the MDRD study that had more patients with advanced CKD and none with relatively normal renal function. The figures here show the mean bias for each equation across the range of EGF4. You can see that both equations perform better at lower EGF4 levels. However, the MDRD equation had a systematic bias, particularly at higher levels of GF4. And so for this reason, KDGO recommends using the CKD epi equation for creatinine-based GF4 estimation in clinical practice. Compared to MDRD, it is less biased, more accurate, and has improved risk reclassification, meaning that it classifies a patient in it into a particular CKD category. If it classifies a patient into a particular CKD category, they are more likely to be correctly classified. About 84% of measurements are within 30% of true GF4. Of course, this is still a pretty low bar. But it means that about, because it means about one in seven of these measurements will be outside that range. Although the CKD epi test is a recommended test, most institutions, I think, use, use the MDRD uh, equation still, and certainly we do at the Brigham. Cystatin C based equations are better at risk stratification in individuals at the borderline of CKD stage three, but these are not generally used in clinical practice, and cystatin C, I don't think most people would use that routinely to, uh, as a measurement. So, So as I said before, KDGO has recommended using the blended creatinine uh, or the cystatin C equation for patients with equivocal GF4 measurements as a better predictor of outcomes in patients with moderate, moderate declines in GF4. In 2013, Mike Schlipback published a paper, paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that adding cystatin C to the creatinine equation led to reclassification that was associated with reduced risk for all outcomes. In particular, there was a 21% reclassification improvement for mortality. However, there was no net reclassification improvement for CKD progression or end-stage renal disease. So why would this be? The question appears to have been answered by this study by Andrew Rule in Kidney International. What this shows is that the correlation between measured GF4 and estimated GF4 by each equa equation and various risk factors. As expected, there is a significant correlation between measured GF4 and uh, and with all of the GF4 estimations and 24-year protein, hypertension, and diabetes that are known risk factors for chronic kidney disease. 
Also, there is very little difference between the measured GF4 and the estimated GF4 based on creatinine only, uh, only calculations. However, across all of these categories, there was more correlation between the risk factors and cystatin C based equations, with the most bias in the cystatin C equation alone. In particular, there was almost no correlation between creatinine based measurements or measured GF4 and CRP, whereas there was a significant correlation with cystatin C based EGF4 measurements. What this means is that probably the reason why cystatin C is better at predicting mortality but not end stage renal disease is that the non GF4 determinants of cystatin C are associated with mortality and that these equations are just picking out patients who are at a higher risk for reasons unrelated to GF4. This is perfectly fine if you're looking for an equation that's going to predict mortality, but it's not good if you're looking for an equation that's accurately measuring GF4 or estimating GF4. So the answer to this question then is actually the CKD epi cystatin C equation, likely because of the factors mentioned before. If the question had been end stage renal disease, then the answer would have been CKD epi creatinine formula because it is not dependent on inflammation and other factors which, while they increase the mortality risk, are not associated with the risk of ESRD beyond uh, EGF4 alone. So how many patients actually have CKD? The prevalence has been estimated using data from the National Health and Nutrition Survey going back to 1988. This figure shows the distribution of GFR measures in the first survey compared with the third survey. In the initial surveys, it was estimated around 5%, and this increased gradually to about 8% by 2001-2002. Since then, it has stabilized and has remained around about 8%. The prevalence of CKD increases rapidly with increasing age, and the reason for the increase in prevalence over time is likely because of more individuals living long enough to get CKD and those patients living longer with the disease. Why there's been no increase in the last 10 years is less clear, but it may be due to better and earlier recognition and treatment of risk factors for cardiovascular disease, many of which are shared with chronic kidney disease, leading to a lower overall incidence. Uh, I should also mention that this particular slide, these estimates are based on EGF4 reduction alone and don't account for albuminuria or any of the other definitions of CK that we use. This slide shows the prevalence, overall prevalence of each individual category of CKD in the general population. Because this also includes patients with microalbuminuria, the overall prevalence at 11.5% is higher than the NHANES estimates. What really jumps out here is that 75% of individuals classed as having CKD have either microalbuminuria alone without a reduction in GF4 or stage 3 CKD without proteinuria. These are the patients for whom we don't have any specific treatments and who some would argue don't really have CKD depending on their age. Less than 1% of patients in the population have CKD stage 4 or higher. So this gets back to the question again about the relevance of small declines in renal function, particularly in the elderly. The fact that GF4 declines with age has been recognized for a long time. This is a figure from a physiology textbook from the 1960s that showed the measured GF4 of a variety of individuals at various ages. In these subjects, there was a clear relationship with kidney, between kidney function and age. So the question is, is this just physiologic and do we need to care about it? The one benefit of having long-running epidemiologic studies is that it allows you to generate estimates of lifetime risk of chronic diseases. These, ki these kind of studies had been somewhat lacking in the nephrology literature up until a couple of years ago. This is a study that was published in AJKD in 2013 that used a model to estimate the lifetime risk of CKD based on point estimates of NHANES data. The same data that was used to generate the prevalence estimates that we saw before. This is possibly a little flawed because it is difficult to account for the competing risk of death when you don't have longitudinal follow-up of individual patients. And so the estimates may be a little inflated. They found that the lifetime risk of CKD stages 3A, B, 4, and end-stage renal disease were 60%, 35%, 11%, and 3.6%. So according to these estimates, about three in five people, if they live long enough, will develop CKD. The vast majority of this is being driven by the over 70 population, where the prevalence of CKD is more than 50%. You can see here that the risk increases exponentially with the incidence really taking off after age 60 in all categories. 
So again, you can argue that this is just normal decline with aging, and is it really relevant? Well, if you consider hypertension, one of the most important risk factors for cardiovascular disease, the lifetime risk of hypertension has been estimated at 90%. So you're pretty much guaranteed to develop hypertension if you live long enough. No one considers this a normal part of aging, and no one considers it a disease you don't treat. Similarly for diabetes, the lifetime risk in the United States has been estimated at 30%, which is not too far from the lifetime risk of chronic kidney disease. So essentially for all these long-term chronic kidney diseases, the lifetime risk is extremely high, but it doesn't mean that we necessarily ignore them because it's elderly patients who are getting them. Despite this very high prevalence, very few patients are actually aware that they have chronic kidney disease. Only 7.5% of patients with stage 3 chronic kidney disease in a recent study were aware of this fact, and even for those with stage 4 chronic kidney disease, only about 40% of them were aware that they had the disease. This is a relatively small sample size, but it is incredible that less than half of people with this degree of chronic kidney disease were aware that they had it. Then again, we can ask the question of that is, if this, this is mostly age-related decline and the vast majority of these patients will never need renal replacement therapy, which is certainly true, is it really important? Because if you think about the fact that the lifetime incidence of, or lifetime risk of chronic kidney disease is 60%, but the lifetime risk of end-stage renal disease is less than 4%. So most of these patients will never progress, and they'll die long before they progress with cardiovascular disease. Well, there are two ways I'd like to answer this question. The first is to think about how the presence of risk factors influences this decline, and the second is to look at the real-world consequences. There was a study done in Baltimore where a cohort of patients had serial 24-hour urine collections done between the 1950s and the 1980s. In this diverse cohort, one-third of patients had no decline in renal function, and in a small percentage, there was actually a statistically significant increase in GFR. So what was different about these patients? And if this so-called age-related decline is not inevitable at all, what's actually driving it? In this study, we took patients with, from the Framingham Heart Study and looked at the prevalence of specific risk factors 10, 20, and 30 years prior to the onset of CKD. For those patients who later developed CKD, there was a higher prevalence of hypertension, obesity, and diabetes up to 30 years prior to the development of CKD. What this suggests is that risk factor modification done at the time of CKD initiation is probably too late, and this may be part of the reason that interventions to delay or stop CKD progression have not been particularly successful. Perhaps addressing these risk factors much earlier in the course of disease will be much more successful. So it's fascinating, like the, the underlying strata of these patients look completely different 30 years before they developed CKD. We also looked at the lifetime risk of chronic kidney disease using Framingham data. The overall lifetime estimates for CKD were lower than in the N. Haynes study. This is in part because we excluded patients with CKD at age 50 and looked at the residual lifetime risk after that age. We then stratified patients according to the presence or absence of three known CKD risk factors at baseline, hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. What is interesting and obvious, you would say, is that the more risk factors you have at baseline, the higher your lifetime risk of CKD. For patients with no risk factors at age 50 who did not have diabetes, hypertension, or, or weren't, weren't obese, and these, all these patients may have gone on to develop these different risk factors, but at that particular point in their lives, they did not have these risk factors. The lifetime risk was only about 35% for CKD, compared to greater than 50% for those with more than three risk factors. This again speaks to the idea that stage 3 CKD is not necessarily benign and is, in, and is influenced by long-term exposure to these risk factors. You can see here in particular, if you had three risk factors, the slope took off very, very quickly and your risk of CKD went up very early. I think the reason why it levels off up here is because these patients were all dying. These are patients who had diabetes, were obese, and had hypertension at age 50. They weren't really living until they were 70 or 80 years of age, or 80 or 90 years of age at least. So what are the real, specific real-world consequences of chronic kidney disease, of early chronic kidney disease, I should say? This group published data from a meta-analysis of various CKD cohorts. They found that CKD was associated with an increased risk of all cause and cardiovascular mortality. For both of these outcomes, the inflection point was around 60 mils per minute of GF4. They similarly looked at albinuria and found it in association with, uh, with mortality. And again, there was a marked increase in mortality with relatively low levels of albinuria. Later, this same group repeated the analysis and restricted it to individuals over 70 years. And they found this association with mortality was entirely independent of age. 
and that there was a significant increase with minimal declines in GF4 even in this age group. So even in the over 70 age group, if your GF4 is less than 60, you have a significant increased risk of cardiovascular mortality. Another meta-analysis looked at a series of outcomes, including all-cause and cardiovascular mortality, end-stage renal disease, acute kidney injury, and progressive chronic kidney disease. For all of these outcomes, there was an increased risk when the GF4 fell below 60. And when you further stratify by albinuria status, so at the very bottom here in each one, this is no albinuria, and this is microalbinuria and macroalbinuria. So when you further, further stratify by this, the more albinuria that was present, the higher the risk for all outcomes. This study from the New England Journal of Medicine, this is the Schlipak study I mentioned earlier on, looked at the relative performance of the CKD epic equation and the cystatin C uh, equations at predicting mortality in end stage renal disease. As I mentioned before, the cystatin C equation performed better at predicting cardiovascular disease and all cause mortality, but was no better at predicting the risk of end stage renal disease, likely again due to the presence of non GF4 determinants of, CK, of cystatin C levels. Finally, this slide, which is a very, very busy slide, but it is interesting if you look at it in detail, um, is, uh, shows a summary of the relative risks of various outcomes for patients at various CKD stages with and without albuminuria. It's a numerical representation of the slide that we saw, we saw just a couple of slides ago, and nicely demonstrates how even early stages of chronic kidney disease are associated with adverse outcomes, including kidney failure and death. Which brings us to the second question. What do we do to delay progression in patients with and without established chronic kidney disease? So a 63-year-old white woman uh, with a history of hypertension presents for evaluation. Her labs are notable for creatinine of 1.3, uric acid of 7.4, her urinary albumin to creatinine ratio is 66, her blood pressure is 135 over 68, her examination is otherwise normal. Which of the following interventions has been shown to decrease the risk of chronic kidney disease progression in this patient. Start allopurinol to target a uric acid level of less than 6. Start lisinopril to target a blood pressure of less than 130. Decrease protein intake to less than 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. Start lisinopril targeting a urinary albumin to creatinine ratio of less than 30, or none of the above. So the first question we come to here is how do you actually define CKD progression? And this isn't as easy as it might sound, because if you think about it, if you put somebody on an ACE inhibitor, their creatinine will often go up and their GF4 will go down. But no one's going to consider that these patients have progressed. So how do you define progression in clinical studies and in clinical practice? So in population-based cohorts with healthy volunteers, the normal GF4 decline is 0.2 to 1 mil per minute per meter squared per year. However, as we've seen before, there are a considerable number of patients for whom there is no decline over time. There is no current clear definition of CKD progression, but the 2012 KDDO guidelines suggested the following, which are being used for research purposes at least. So decline is defined as a change in GF4 category, or certain progression is defined as a decline in GF4 category with a 25% reduction in EGF4. Rapid progression is defined as a decline of more than 5 mils per minute per year. The problem is that the idea of a steady decline in GF4 over time in patients is not borne out by reality. This notion that people have a gradual, inexorable decline in their GF4 once CKD initiates is not really true. This is a really uh, interesting study that was published in AJKD a couple of years ago that looked at the trajectory of, of change in GF4 over time in 840 individuals from the ASK study. To be included, they had to have at least three years of follow-up and at least eight GF4 measurements. The figures on the left are some of the graphs of EGF4 change over time, and each one represents one patient. What is fascinating is just how nonlinear these changes are. In fact, about half of the participants had a nonlinear trajectory of an, or a prolonged period of non progression. Predictors of non progression included GF4 of greater than 40 at baseline and the, presence of, and the absence of proteinuria. 9% of participants had both a period of rapid decline and a period of non progression. This, of course, speaks to one of the problems of clinical trials of CKD progression. There's so much variability in GF4 decline between individuals that it's, and within individuals, of course, that it's hard to determine if an intervention has a beneficial effect or if it's just due to statistical noise. So again, we need to know if CKD progression is important and if it affects hard outcomes over time. 
This study used registry data from Canada and included 600,000 individuals with at least two creatinine measures spaced six months apart. Those with a certain drop in GF4 defined as a change in GF4 category and a 25% decline in GF4 had a two-fold increase in all-cause mortality and a five-fold increase in the risk of end-stage renal disease. So CKD progression is bad. So how then can we delay progression of CKD? These are the 2012 KDGO guidelines for prevention of CKD progression. For each population and intervention, they give the level of evidence for this guideline. One means that they recommend, and two means that they suggest. Level of evidence indicated by the letter, A means high, B means moderate, C means low, and D means very low. The only guidelines that received a 1A recommendation in this report was that individuals with diabetes should keep their HbA1c less than 7%. This has been shown in a randomized controlled trial. There is also relatively good evidence for the guidelines to reduce blood pressure below 140 over 90 and to use an ACE or an ARB in patients with macroalbuminuria. The rest are essentially suggestions based on limited and mostly observational data. So we come back to this question again. Which of these has been shown to delay progression in this patient? Allopurinol has not been shown in RCT to be ben beneficial. A target of blood pressure of less than 130 has been recommended, but has not been shown to decrease progress progression. And in fact, in the SPRINT trial that was recently published, intensive blood pressure reduction was associated with an increased risk of incident CKD in patients without CKD at baseline. There were no beneficial renal, effect, renal effects, although the number of events was actually pretty low. Protein restriction has been suggested in fin for individuals with advanced CKD, but is not recommended for somebody with CKD stage three. And finally, in patients without diabetes, there is no study that specifically shows the benefit of ACE inhibition for microalbuminuria, and in particular, there is no role for targeting a specific level of urinary albumin to creatinine. This may be in part because some of these interventions decrease GF4 in the short term, and this can distort the results of the studies. So as always, the answer here is that more research is needed. Are these interventions truly beneficial? When should they be initiated for maximum benefit? And have we already missed a boat if we're starting when somebody has already has CKD stage three? Because I've shown before, these patients have been exposed to long term, long term to these risk factors for mostly vascular disease. And we're doing a study here at the moment where we're looking at um, historic um, uh, nephrectomy specimens in individuals with relatively normal kidney function. And it's amazing how much vascular disease these patients have without any albuminuria, so moderate declines in GF4 with severe vascular disease. And when you look at these biopsies in these patients with GF4s of you know, 50 and 60, you can see why nothing works, because they've already got all the damage that's there, and it's just, you just know that it's inevitable it's going to progress at that point. So lastly, I want to talk very briefly about a novel tool that we can all use in clinical practice and that I've found useful, particularly when talking to patients. Navdeep Tangri uh, used data initially from two Canadian cohorts and subsequently from a large meta-analysis of multinational cohorts to develop a risk score for CKD progression based on a small number of predictive factors. His website is kidneyfailurerisk.com. You can enter the patient's age, gender, location, meaning North America or non-North America, current EGF4, and urinary albumin to creatinine ratio. My biggest criticism of this study is the use of a geographic determinant. I suspect that the reason why individuals from North America have a higher risk of, incident of incidence of CKD progression is because of the African-American population who are, most like, who are more likely to reach end stage at all levels of GF4. Uh, than equivalent Caucasians. And this is maybe or possibly due to the effect of um, APOL1 on a population level. Still, this is what we have for the moment. So we'll take a 65-year-old man from North America with an EGF4 of 35 and microalbuminuria. This calculator will inform you that he has stage three chronic kidney disease uh, and that the risk of progression to end-stage renal disease requiring dialysis is 4% at two years and 12% at five years. These are relatively high values, even though it may not seem so. When you think about it, these are high values, considering that patients who do on dialysis have a 20% mortality every year. So I think it's a very useful tool when you're discussing prognosis and the importance of risk factor management with patients and other healthcare professionals. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll take any questions. Yeah, that's. I, I actually met him at the ASN last year, and I hadn't seen the final the final version of this. And if I had, I would have said it to him. I did say to one of his colleagues recently. I don't know why they did this. When we know 
We know from population studies that if you are of African American origin and you have a GF4 of 35, you're much more likely to end up on dialysis than somebody who's white. And I think this is probably being driven by ethnic origin rather than, like, ge it's geographic location, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So, as it is right now, if you have a patient that doesn't have any local mobility, but maybe have a CCD1, CCD2, is there anything that, with your experience, that you recommend we can do for that patient? Um, I, the problem is, I, I don't think there. I don't think there is. I mean, we just addressed the traditional cardiovascular risk factors. I think that's the most important thing, and particularly in patients with microalbuminuria, I think we have to be very careful about addressing these factors because really the the primary outcome in these patients is that they're going to die of cardiovascular disease, and so that's the biggest risk here. And so it should be used because we don't really have any specific interventions at this time. It should be used really as a signal for identifying patients at a high cardiovascular risk at an earlier stage.